welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And today our topic matter is constipation. And we're talking about constipation of the body, not of our, our, of our Congress right now. But let's take a peek and see, first of all, what the symptoms are, the causes, and what we can do about it. Oh, man, this is probably one of the most common complaints that um, we get in our health food stores is constipation. And it's usually really easily resolved, but it's not one particular thing that usually resolves the issue. So when we look at the symptoms of constipation, we're gonna always see, number one, difficulty in passing stools. So what happens is you're sitting in the restroom and you're unable to eliminate, or you're in there for 15 or 20 minutes. You should be able to go in the restroom and you're out of there in five minutes. If you're in there for long periods of time, that means you have constipation. I have more people that say I have one bowel movement a day. If that's all the bowel movements you have a day, you're constipated. One bowel movement or less per day is constipation. Two to three, up to four bowel movements a day is considered normal. See, when you eat your food, it takes it about six to 24 hours before it passes through all the digestion process and whatever waste products there are, it is eliminated. So if you're eating you know, three to five meals per day, obviously you should be having more bowel movements than just one a day. Now, another symptom obviously is people will get gas, they'll feel bloated. I've had people come in and say, you know, I haven't had a bowel movement for a week and their tummies become, or their abdomen becomes extended out. Uh, they have tons of gas. They start cramping because the body's really trying to get the, the excrement out, but it can't. So when we look, those are the symptoms, and I think most everybody knows what the symptoms of constipation are. <sighs> causes, now there's so many different causes. When we look at it, number one is always going to be your poor, a poor diet. Uh, low in fiber, lacking good fats, uh, dehydration, people who drink tons of coffee will be dehydrated and they'll be washing out their minerals and they'll wonder why they're so constipated. Um, stress or inactivity, physical inactivity where people are not moving causes, causes people to become impacted. Medications. There's a slew of those out there, um, my gosh, uh, going from painkillers uh, to uh, acid redux drugs because they block all the utilization of minerals so you, and, and stomach acid so you can't break down your food. And that's another issue then we're talking about is the lack of enzymes or if a gallbladder is removed, the inability of uh, the liver to properly excrete bile to break food down. So the lack of enzymes. Uh, the types of food that you're eating, um, if they're high sugar, particularly if they're things like pasta. I had a customer that came in today and said he had big old chicken and pasta dish and he was constipated for two days. Very little fiber, a lot of sticky uh, carbohydrates can cause constipation. Um, food allergies. Now, oftentimes when people have celiac or, um, you know, that's a gluten intolerance, or they have certain types of food allergies, it can cause a lot of bowel inflammation. And they'll either get chronic diarrhea or they'll get constipation. Magnesium deficiencies. Um, the National Institute of Health says 90, over 90% 90 of Americans are magnesium deficient. They estimate we are only about 40% are, does the average American get from their diet. Now remember too, that's eating from the diet, that doesn't count all the monster drinks and the coffee that everybody's drinking that washes out your magnesium and potassium out of the body. So those mineral deficiencies are a major contributing factor. Lack of good bacteria in the bowel. So particularly with antibiotics or allergy medications or steroidals or just bad food that doesn't have any soil-based organisms, you're eating a lot of processed foods. You'll lack those good critters in there to break down the food, and when you lack the good critters to break down the food, it stays whole. It doesn't break down. You can't eliminate it, nor can you absorb the nutrient value from any of the food. Um, overuse of laxatives. Now, I have a lot of people that are doing uh, laxatives on a daily basis, and over a period of time, the body becomes accustomed to those, 
and <laughs> it shuts down its own natural ability because it's expecting you're going to give it a laxative every day. These are um, training your uh, intestines to be weak. So it's very important that you don't chronically become addicted to using laxatives in order to eliminate. Pesticides, or excuse me, parasites and yeast, chemicals, all those can contribute to uh, problems with the, with the bowel. So if you get a yeast infection, parasite infection, or you're dumping down tons of chemicals in the body that destroy your good bacteria, those too contrib contribute to constipation. If you look on here, the list is just extensive. <sighs> Narrowing it down to the most common causes though, lack of fiber, lack of good fats in the diet, lack of magnesium, lack of water, lack of probiotics, and lack of enzymes. Those are the six most common reasons why we have constipation. And I usually go through a checklist when my customers come in and I'll check that off and then whatever they're lacking, I circle it and then I try to supplement or uh, change their diet or get them to change their diet uh, to accommodate whatever they're deficient in. Now, foods to avoid when you are constipated. Saturated fats, beef and pork, um, pastas, a lot of um, processed types of carbohydrates, soda, caffeine, anything that washes out your uh, water out of the body, chocolate, uh, fried foods, uh, dairy. Now, New, the New England Medical Journal basically said when they examined why children were constipated, <laughs> they discovered that two-thirds of the children were constipated because of dairy. So remember milk, and I was in the dairy business before, milk is a very good source of calcium, but it lacks magnesium. That's why it can cause kidney stones, constipation, raise blood pressure, all kinds of things. So if you're going to have your kids or be giving your kids uh, dairy to drink, you're going to probably have to supplement with some source of magnesium supplement to help them. And it comes in liquids and, and uh, chewable types of uh, supplementation that you can help them with. Now, looking at the diet. They estimate that only about 2% of the population eats a diet that is what is listed on here. 2%. That's one out of every 50 people. So we must have a real constipated nation without taking laxatives and everything else. Okay, number one, 35 grams of fiber is what is required in order to have proper elimination. And now this is a combination of what we call soluble and insoluble fiber, fruits and vegetables and grains. And I got to tell you, it takes a good eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables and grains in order to get that 35 grams of fiber. And most people look at me and say, I have my vegetables for dinner. Oh, I had an apple. And I'm like, okay, that two servings of fruits and vegetables, it ain't going to cut it. So pra from a practical standpoint, I know it's difficult. I know I do smoothies. I um, you know, use my Vitamix and I mix up the vegetables and the fruit. But you do need to try and attempt to get that eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables. Good fats in the diet, and I'm talking things like walnuts, almonds, pecans, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, avocados. Those good fats reduce bowel inflammation, but it also makes it slippery in the bowel. So, uh, for example, if you're doing high meat fats and you're getting hardly any of these good plant-based types of fats, you're going to tend to have that constipation. Remember, too, these also help reduce inflammation, and that includes inflammation in the bowel as well. Um, fermented foods. The United States has gotten away from eating things like sauerkraut, um, you know, kimchi, things like that. A lot of the uh, oriental populations or populations in India eat fermented foods. Um, these fermented foods help with the bacteria in the bowel, and when you have the bacteria in the bowel, obviously you're going to break your food down a little bit better. Drink at least eight glasses of water per day. Okay, now I'm talking eight glasses if you're not downing the monsters in caffeine drinks. Because if you are, if you're having a soda or you're having one of the caffeine drinks, you better add an extra eight to 12 ounces of water for every one of those you have. So if you're drinking three to four cups, I'm not talking a big, huge monster, which is about three servings, but 
three to four cups of something, and that's eight ounces, you're going to have to add three to four cups of extra water. That's 12 glasses of water, and that's a lot. The only problem with this is we're adding water, but we're also, when we're doing these caffeines, we're walk, washing away the minerals, particularly your uh, trace minerals, your magnesium, and your potassium. That's why one of the supplements I have listed uh, below, one of the, I think it's nine supplements, is magnesium because most Americans are deficient and we're washing it away with all the caffeine. So, since I know the majority of people are not going to do uh, this amount of water, good fats in the diet, fermented foods, and adequate amounts of fiber, there are supplemental ways uh, that can help. Um, and mind you, I would always love to see you getting your fiber from your, your diet uh, and your good fats from your diet. Now, magnesium is virtually impossible. With the uh, farming pro commercial farming practices of today, the soil is extremely depleted of minerals, trace minerals, and particularly magnesium. So uh, since we require six to 800 milligrams of magnesium per day, supplementation between uh, four to 600 milligrams per day, and it needs to be a magnesium citrate, citrate. I see these advertisements that offer mag ox, magnesium oxide, and I'm like going, and I have more doctors recommend magnesium oxide, which is synthesized in a laboratory, and only has maybe a seven to 14 percent absorption rate. It's not going to help you with anything that you want to use magnesium with. But magnesium citrate in an amino chelated form or a Krebs cycle magnesium um, is going to be the best form in order to aid and abet of the elimination process. Fibers. Now, the most common fibers for, um, obviously, for elimination other than food is psyllium fiber, flax, seed, uh, meal, I prefer, I prefer that ground up, and chia seeds or chia seed meal. Now, these have high amounts of fiber for only maybe a couple of tablespoons a serving. I mean, you can get six to eight grams of fiber alone and at least get maybe one-fifth of your uh, required fiber amount just by adding these into a smoothie, a protein shake, or some water. If you're not going to eat your nuts or you have nut allergies, because I hear that a lot, then we need to examine maybe taking some omegas. Now, omega-3s would inc include fish, flax, and then, of course, the plant-based uh, ones that I already went over. And those omega-3s reduce the inflammation in your bowel, but they also help it be slippery. Sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds also are rich in that. If you can't or are vegetarian, flax seed, sesame seed oil, uh, those are really good, or that is a very good oil that you can take as well for reduction of inflammation and to help with bowel movement. Remember, you need 25 to 30 milligrams, or excuse me, grams per day of good fats in your diet. So that would be equivalent to at least uh, right about a half a cup to three quarters of a cup of those nuts and avocados. So this is one way you can get it by adding it to a shake or taking it in a supplement form. Probiotics, especially if you've been on antibiotics. These are the good critters that eat up the bacteria. Now you've got to be particular about your probiotics. I'm telling you, going to your local drugstore or your supermarket center isn't going to cut it. You need to make sure that they guarantee that the amount of the bacteria in there are going to be up to the time of the, of the expiration date of the item and that they are protected from stomach acid secretions. These uh, little critters, these little probiotics that sit in our bowel that help us break down food are very sensitive to stomach acids in the stomach. So you want to make sure you have a very good quality brand. I would go into a good health food store, look for something on the bottle that makes those claims. Um, digestive enzymes. Now it's funny, um, I have a lot of people in, in Lompoc here that have no gallbladder. Okay, and because of that they don't have proper liver bile excretion. And uh, in good medical schools they teach doctors that when you remove the gallbladder that you have to add some form of enzymes and they do have prescription enzymes for that. But since I find that most physicians will not recommend that, I've listed on here some enzymes that are appropriate if you have an enzyme issue, or if you have no gallbladder, or if you have a liver comp uh, compromise or a pancreatic compromise as far as digestive enzymes are concerned. 
Um, A's and AB blood types tend to require a little bit of stomach acid secretion in their enzymes so they can break down meats, whereas O's and um, particularly O blood types and B blood types, plant source uh, enzymes are appropriate to help with digestion. Aloe vera juice and gel. I'll tell you, that's probably one of the best uh, natural laxatives because besides healing the entire digestive tract, it's a natural laxative that's really easy on the body and aids and abets the elimination. A very good alternative to doing laxatives in your body, since it is a food, doesn't become accustomed to it. There are a couple of herbs that are known for helping with liver bile excretion and elimination. Dandelion and milk thistle. They can stimulate uh, bile production and also aid and abet liver enzymes, which aid and abet the digestion as well for the breakdown of your foods. I mean, there's not, it's not a lengthy list here, and a good portion of this you can get from your diet, but I would strongly encourage you to examine, particularly supplement-wise, uh, magnesium, if you can't get the other items from your diet, magnesium, enzymes, and probiotics as probably being something that you're probably not getting adequate, even if you're eating the best of diet. I hope that helps. Um, we're going to be moving on next to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And I'm going to show you a couple of exercises. There are several that you can do for constipation. But these two you may find as being very helpful. We start off in what we call staff pose, bringing up the right leg and then on the left side, we're going to turn the left. And all we're doing is we're shifting the body around to where we're looking hopefully about 180 degrees. And the goal is this, of this is to press on the liver, the gallbladder, and the stomach. And oftentimes when I do this pose, I'll notice when I'm done with the sequence that I will burp because it actually can stimulate the release of, of certain gases. Um, and then, of course, you're going to want to work the other side and the other angle in equal amounts. The key is you're just wanting to turn around and feel that nice little compression on those muscles down all throughout this area. Uh, another good pose is called the child pose. It's probably one of the favorites in most yoga because it's a resting pose. And you get down on your knees, and as best you can, if your knees aren't all that great, you can put yourself up or put a blanket in here between. But we get down into what is called a child pose. And what that is, is we're compressing our bowel down when we're on top of it like that. And that can help with compressing uh, excrement down into the colon. I hope those help. Uh, there's more exercises uh, to be demonstrated, but I think those two are good ones. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. I can tell. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Turciano. And thank you for that intro. Mm -hmm. Now, first up is an article titled, Uncovering a Healthy Remedy for Chronic Pain. Sounds like a health food item altogether, but this was published in the Annals of Neurology. And chronic pain seems becoming more and more pervasive today, and less and less options seem available to treat it. Well, here's an interesting one that comes from omega-3 fish oils. What they discovered, this was from Duke University, again published in the Annals of Neurology. DHA, the main ingredient, actually part of the main ingredient, a fish oil supplements can soothe and prevent neuropathic pain caused by injuries to the sensory system. Research focused on a couple of components of DHA, omega-3, the neuroprotectin D1 and protectin D1, otherwise known as NPD1 and PD1. The compounds are derived from omega-3 fatty acids found in fish oil, but are 1,000 times more potent in the precursor reducing inflammation. So when doing omega-3s, it's not going to be as potent as what these guys are working on, but DHA would be the best place to start. The findings revealed that NPD1 and PD1 not only alleviated the pain, 
but also reduced nerve swelling, something many of your painkillers are not going to do, or opiates, but also reduced nerve swelling, as I said, following the injuries, meaning DHA is not a bad idea to keep around. Its analgesic effect stems from the compound's ability to prohibit, inhibit, not prohibit, the production of cytokines and chemokines, which are small signaling molecules that attract inflammatory macrophages to the nerve cells. By preventing cytokines and chemokine production, the compounds protected the nerve cells from further damage. Let your common painkiller try and do that. But NPD1, NPD1 also reduced neuron firing, so the injured animals in the test felt less pain. Chronic pain resulting from major medical procedures such as amputation, chest, and breast surgery is a serious problem. Current treatment options for neuropathic pain include gabapentin and various opioid, opioids, opiates, which may lead to addiction and destruction of the sensory nerves themselves. On the other hand, NPD1, NPD1 from omega-3 fish oil, particularly the one called DHA, can relieve neuropathic pain at very low doses. And more importantly, animals receiving the treatment did not show signs of physical dependence or enhanced tolerance, which is interesting. There's a lot of painkillers you develop a tolerance to. DHA from omega-3, you do not. Real interesting. Remember, the omega-3 is just become part of our diet, too. So basically, it's, maybe it's one reason why our ancestors are a little more tolerant to pain and working so hard is because the amount of omega-3s in the diet was significant enough to reduce the pains and the soreness of the daily hard labor they had to do. And they also said, too, DHA is very inexpensive, especially inexpensive since you, don't, since you think about the lack of addictive properties and the lack of tolerance being built to it. DHA, Annals of Neurology, they did the study with Duke University, and it kicked butt. After that, vitamins and minerals can boost energy and enhance mood. I know you guys hear a lot of negative from the media from time to time on vitamins and minerals, but guess what? There's a lot, a lot of good research out there that you don't get to hear. And this was published in, or for, announced at the 2013 Institute of Food Technologi Technology Annual Meeting Food Expo held in McCormick Place. What they discovered was this. Monday, they basically said on Monday during the conference, vitamins and minerals can be, and this is what they're saying, not me, this is what the scientists are saying, can be the alternative to increasing psychiatric medicines for symptom relief of anxiety and depression. The supplements, she said, can provide the mental energy necessary to manage stress, enhance mood, and reduce fatigue. Mm -hmm. Vitamins and minerals. Next time you go to your doctor, say you're feeling down, how many times do you say, hey, you taking a multivitamin? Mm -hmm. Good question. All right, a series of studies they conducted in Canada. Studies. Kaplan found that at least 97 adults diagnosed mood, with diagnosed with mood disorders who kept a three-day food record said the higher intake of vitamins and minerals significantly correlated with the overall, overall enhanced mental functioning. Also from the University of Utah, they said, quote, and this was their addendum, 5-HTP, vitamins B, as in boy, and D, as in David in particular, as well as ginkgo biloba and omega-3. All right, again, that was from the 2013 Institute of Food Technolo Technologists. Apologize about that. And coming up, ginkgo biloba. I know ginkgo biloba has been chastised quite a bit in the media, but often what happens with ginkgo biloba, they don't do the study on the right groups. Doing, using ginkgo biloba in a bunch of 25-year-olds is not going to get you the study results you're looking for. However, this is what was published in the Neural Regeneration Research, Volume 8, November 18th, 2013, no, number 18, apologize, 2013, on ginkgo biloba. Ginkgo biloba, they found, was good for vascular dementia. So it is important to stimulate what they believe is called androgynous neural stem proliferation and differentiation. The ginkgo biloba extract, in particular, EGB761, effectively and safely treated memory loss and cognitive impairments in patients with senile dementia. Ginkgo biloba, the extracts from it, did the job. 
Researchers have found the ginkgo biloba extract, in particular EGB761, which is a component of ginkgo, promoted and prolonged the proliferation of neural stem cells in the subventricular zone and detained gyrus in rats with vascular dementia. The cells continued to proliferate at four months while on ginkgo biloba. The extract also significantly improved learning and memory in rats with vascular dementia. Mm. Again, ginkgo biloba, very good, and according to them, shown to work for senile dementia, especially when it's regards to vascular dementia. Again, well-researched, well-studied, published in a peer-reviewed journal called Neural Regeneration Research, Volume 8, Number 18, year 2013. And last but not least, I wanted to go do pull up a little article on BPA being damaging once again. Once again, BPA is called bisphenol A. But ironically, we'll pull up that information. There were six negative studies that came out of bisphenol A all within the same week from many different organizations. I'm going to run through the titles real fast just in case I run out of time, and then I'll go back into the data. Ex early exposure to bisphenol A might damage the enamel of the teeth, American Journal of Pathology. Mm. Bisphenol A linked to obesity risk in puberty age girls, Public Library of Science Online. BPA linked to a common birth defect in boys, the Endocrine Society's 95th Annual Meeting in San Francisco. Exposure to BPA in developing prostate cancer increases risk of later, later cancer. Again, the Endocrine Society 95th Annual Meeting. BPA plus chlorine equals bad news. And that was published online in Endocrine Disruptors. That all came out five days ago from different organizations as, poted, as pointed out. All right, I'm going to go through it real fast. They discovered that basically exposure to BPA in the early ages causes the demineralization of the teeth. And what that does is lead the children to more cavities later on in life. The BPA exposed to puberty age girls. They found out the girls with the highest level of BPA had double the risk of obesity as the ones without them. The common birth defect in boys, they found out it caused the testicular part of the body, testes, not to descend. Most common birth defect in boys, prostate cancer, cell proliferation, BPA when mixed with chlorine, stops the cells from communicating all together in the body. And again, while the media focuses on vitamins, they allow this stuff to slip through, which is more than lethal to a large majority of the population. And that is it. Thank you very much for this section. Very good, Ralph. Thank you very much. Once again, do your research and uh, catch this on TAP TV, Comcast, Channel 25, or on YouTube.com uh, forward slash VH Film. Thank you very much.